the Thursday of Jesus' final week before being crucified and before resurrection that he said this commandment to his disciples. Jesus and his disciples had just shared what was known as the Last Supper. And he was washing their feet when he stated this. And you can find it in John chapter 13. But Jesus says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you, and you also are to love one another. So today we pause to acknowledge this command of us loving one another by reading the story tonight of what Jesus did for us, his demonstration of his love for us on this Thursday. The Passover supper had just been eaten. Jesus has concluded his upper room discourse. Jesus and the disciples, they, they've just sung a hymn and they left the upper room and they've crossed the Kindred Valley and they've headed over to the Mount of Olives and specifically to the Garden of Gethsemane. In the book of Matthew 26, it records what quickly unfolded in these next few moments of Jesus' life. It starts by saying, Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and I pray. And taking him, Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. So you remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and Jesus began to pray, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but Lord, as you will. And he came to his disciples and he found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, so could you not watch with me for one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for the second time, Jesus goes away and prays. He says, my father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again, he came and he found them sleeping for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and he prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. And then he came to the disciples and he said to them, sleep and take your rest later on. You see, the hour is at hand and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. While he was speaking, Judas came. He was one of the twelve, and with him a great crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign saying, The one I will kiss is the man, so seize him. And he came up to Jesus and at once said, Greetings, Rabbi. And he kissed Jesus on the cheek. And Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you came to do. And then they came up and they laid hands on Jesus and they seized him. And behold, one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand. He drew his sword and he struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. But then Jesus said, put your sword back in its place. For all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father? And, and he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels. But how then should the scriptures be fulfilled? That it must be so. And it was at that hour that Jesus said to the crowds, have you come out against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day, I sat in the temple teaching and you did not seize me. But all of this has taken place that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. And then all the disciples left him and they fled. Do you know what I love about this passage? I love the rawness of it. As you read it, you can feel the tension as the words begin to reveal Jesus' raw emotions. He had his own will. Jesus wasn't a robot that was void of his own personality or his own feelings. And we see in verse 39 that he was asking if there is any other way for redemption to happen. He was totally okay with that. But if death was the only way that he was going to lay down his will and submit to the will of his father. I mean, even the name of the garden shows us the weight that was on Jesus that night. The word Gethsemane actually means oil press in Hebrew. 
What a fitting name for a spot where the sins of the world pressed down on Jesus on the night that he was arrested. During the time of Jesus, there was obviously had been an olive press somewhere nearby. The olive presses of this time period would have had a massive millstone, which was used to crush these olives after the fall harvest. These stones would weigh somewhere around 1,100 pounds each. The olives were placed in a stone pit, and then a donkey was hooked to this millstone, and it pulled this massive stone wheel around in a circle. It's crushing the olives beneath it. And you have to understand that a millstone was designed to crush every bit of the olives, including the seeds, turning them into a mash that filled about 15 baskets. This, this is what we know as the crushing stage, and it was followed by the pressing stage. You see, the baskets which have holes in them were hung onto this long beam of the olive press, and the olives underwent three different presses. During the first press, no pressure was put on the basket, and the olive oil would simply just drip into a three-foot deep vat. Olives are one-third oil, one-third water, and one-third mash. And the oil rises to the top. So they would just scoop off some of the oil that they had, and that was called the first fruits. Now, the first fruits, the finest of the oils, belonged to the Lord. And it was used by the priest in the temple. But during the second press, they used a stone weighing about 500 pounds to put more pressure on the baskets full of olive oils. And the quality of oil from the second press was still good. So people used it for food and for medicine and from cosmetics. But there would still be oil inside the olive mash. So people used stone weights to add even more pressure and squeeze out more of the olive oil. Because this quality of oil from this third press was not as good as the other two. So this oil would typically be used for lamps and to make soap. Why am I explaining all of this? Well, when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed three times. Three times. And there were three presses to the olives. On the last press, you would put as much weight on it as you possibly could. You were literally trying to squeeze out every single drop of olive oil that you could. Look what Luke says in chapter 22, verse 44. He says, And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. The sins of the world pressed down on Jesus with such a weight of sorrow that blood squeezed out of him like oil from crushed olives. What a powerful image. While Jesus prayed in anguish, his disciples were taking the easier way. They were sleeping. Jesus could have easily taken the easy way as well. You know, the Garden of Gethsemane was located very close to a road often used to escape from Jerusalem. So Jesus could have easily slipped away and gone down this road and disappeared into the wilderness. And that would have been the easy path. But Jesus took the hard way. He took the way of the cross, the way of the oil press. It wasn't always easy for him. Yet even in his struggle, he did not sin, but obeyed and trusted God's heart. Jesus' resolve to do the Father's will is echoed in the next scene when he tells his disciples that he has the power to stop everything that's happening just by calling on an army of angels, but instead of calling on those angels, he chooses to fulfill his father's plan. The plan that was there from the very beginning, and that was for Jesus to face the cross for you and I. You see, when a soldier bows to his general or a scholar, to his teacher, he's yielding his will, his life. He gives himself to the rule and the mastery and the power of another. Christ did that. He said he came not to do his own will, but to do the will of his Father. In Gethsemane, he said in Mark 14, Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. On the cross, he suffered what had been settled in Gethsemane. He yielded his life to God, and thereby he taught us that the only thing worth living for is a life that is truly surrendered to God. 
even unto death. And if you're controlling your life and spending it on yourself, even partly, you are abusing it and taking it away from God's original purpose. Learn from Jesus that the beauty and the purpose of having life is so that we can surrender it to God and then allow him to fill it with his glory. And when you say that you follow Jesus, what you're saying is that you are dead to yourself and living for him. Look what Paul said in the book of Galatians chapter 2.20. He said, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who's living within me. In the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You see, following Christ requires a cross. It requires dying to self in such a real way that you can say with Paul that it is no longer I who live. It means giving up your life so completely that Jesus' life is able to fill you. It means the old you is dead, the new life that, that you lead is now empty of you, and it's filled with Jesus. This is good because you are a sinking ship. And we have to escape ourselves into Jesus. You and I, we cannot pursue both God's will and our own independent will. We have to empty ourselves of our will in order to fully embrace the other. When our hearts are surrendered and trusting God and our desires align with God's, and our joy will be made full. So as we pause tonight, we focus on Jesus and his journey to the cross. Let us be reminded of his obedience. My prayer for each one of you is that you will lose your life so that you can find it in him. That your life will be pressed so that all of you comes out, so that all of Jesus can be poured in. Let's pray and thank God for what he's done for us. Father, we thank you for sending your son Jesus to take on the weight of sin, of our sin. Your word says that he who knew no sin became sin on our behalf that we could become the righteousness of God. Tonight we pause and we observe the events that took place on that Thursday night at that last supper and in that garden that Jesus demonstrated his love for us and modeled it so that we can love other people. And I just pray as we look ahead to Easter Sunday that we will not just skip to the resurrection, but God, we will see the events that led to that because of the powerful things that you want us to pull from that and to learn from that so that our lives can align with your will. May we be emptied of ourselves and be full of Jesus. And we thank you for what you're going to do. And we pray these things in your holy name.